हरे कृष्णा शिकुआ माता जी वेलकम टू द मॉन्ग्स पॉडकास्ट डिटी for somebody who can act as a guide and a coach and a guide for devotees when they are practicing their devotional life and facing various challenges you know as devotees we don't want to go to life coaches in the outside world at the same time we have various needs not just directly spiritual needs but we have various needs which may not be automatically addressed while we are in the devotee community so when i travel across the world i have also recommended several devotees who were having some difficulties to connect with you and many of the devotees who have connected with you they have experienced immense relief and uh, they felt it was like a new universe opening for them when they share when they got the wisdom from you and the guidance from you so i have been for a long time desiring that you can share your wisdom on this monks podcast also so thank you very much for joining today Hi Krishna, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And so today we also have with us Gaurav Kumar Prabhu. He is um, one of the leaders in the Bhakti Center, and he's also a very close friend of mine. And he works as the chair of the Computer Science Department in the City of New York University. Is that City? City yeah. So University. yeah. So um, so both of us will be. Discussing, asking some questions to Shukla Mataji together, and then we'll see how it goes today. So, firstly, maybe that you could start with your journey. So, how did you feel the need for, say, I, what word do you use for self-care or say, for 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 caring for ourselves while practicing bhakti? How did you yourself find the need for that? Ah. Uh... when i hit an identity crisis and uh a, a depression where i wanted to kill myself i found that there was a need for something <laughs> that was pretty intense that's quite extreme um, and, and i found that the the theory and the philosophy that had supported me for 27 years was no longer effective in me dealing with the circumstances of my life i felt at a complete loss and i didn't really feel like the the devotees around me they could only offer me theoretical you know scriptural verses and i knew those verses and they weren't penetrating into my heart and um so i i started doing some studying um i took various courses i learned compassionate communication I was just desperate and so I just said Krishna you got to help me here if you want me to get through this you got to help me so he sent various modalities and I uh interspersed and uh worked on myself through all these different practices which to me connect up with our spiritual practice because um our spiritual practice isn't theoretical it's actually a real practice and so um we need to be able to practically apply it and and that's that's what i try to offer and i don't necessarily i guess i give advice but i don't necessarily um see myself as a person who gives advice but i like open up a space where people feel at least safe to speak that they can feel that their words will be heard confidentially that they don't have to fear that i'm going to judge them and that we can look at what's going on for them uh not theoretically but practically what can we do that can move us forward out of whatever stuck place we're in so it's it's more like and it's it's custom designed for whatever person is going through whatever situation there are certain things that are Mm, relevant for everyone and certain things that are custom designed for individuals according to what place they're in so 
my 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 thought and my I saw that there was a need. I saw that I couldn't find anyone to help me. And since Krishna gave me so many tools and so much support, I, I figured he wanted me to give back. So yes, that's that's Thank what you, I wanted. Ramesh. You're just speaking this so cheerfully, but it must have been quite a traumatic experience to go through it, it all. It was intense. It was intense. Yeah. So you know, I have also been over the years. Before I was introduced to Krishna consciousness. One of the main genre of books I would read was self-help books, and then I just left it all, and then I started studying uh, spirit, uh, studying our scriptures, and they were very, I would say, illuminating, enriching. But as Absolutely. you said, that at a particular time, you start feeling that how does this translate into life? What do I do for that? Yes. So, you know, I had tried to come up with a, like a visual model, a Venn diagram. I I would like to share that with you briefly, and then okay. we can move forward. And Gaur Kumar Prabhu, at any time, feel free. You are a part of the discussion. Any time you can chip in, either with a comment or a question, whenever you feel like it. Okay. So while you are pulling that up, I just want to thank Sukhava Mataji because I remember very clearly in 2015 when we went through some challenges um, in our personal lives. You really helped us, uh, helped us in coaching, self care, and. So I'm immensely grateful that I'm having this opportunity uh, to be able to ask uh, some questions. And so thank you, Mataji. Yeah, that. you're welcome. And and I and I think really, um, you know, um, I think as we mature in spiritual life, we come up against, you know, maybe where it was that we left off in our last lifetime. And so, you know we maybe make some rapid progress, but then we come up against a wall of kind of like, okay, now, how do I break through this, you know, because the, the looser energy is, is so powerful and, and we've deluded ourselves. So we need some extra support sometimes to, to break through those walls and then, oh, yeah. Oh, and then we can apply it back and see how it relates to our philosophy. Yeah. It's just Krishna wanting us to, to grow more and more. True. Thank you. Yeah. So see, uh, thank Let, you so much for sharing that. Sure. So this is. And I talk about three things. That's textual spirituality, traditional mm -hmm. spirituality, and applicational spirituality. Wow. So, so textual is basically, what does this, like you said, quoting verses. What does this uh -huh. word mean? How does this word flow into that word? What are the various uh -huh. meanings of this word and that word? Then uh -huh. there is traditional spirituality is where the tradition, how the philosophy is translated by the tradition. So that means okay. a, a particular philosophy comes up, a particular worldview comes up. A specific set of practices come up. Say, worship the deities, chant the holy names, go okay. to the holy places. So we could okay. say, often in our movement, we talk about this itself as application spirituality. Uh -huh. That's but but it's more of that, that we could call it traditional application. Okay. But the applicational spirituality is where we apply to transform ourselves. So, for example, now the way I explain this is, I have a full. Where is it gone? Yeah. Oh. And I won't go over the full presentation, but. Okay, when I wow. talk about application spirituality, then how can I lead a more meaningful and purposeful life? How can yes. I become more understanding and forgiving? How uh -huh. can I manage my emotions? How can I connect better with myself, with others, with nature? Wow. How can I connect with the ultimate reality? How can I become wow. grateful? Wow, yeah. Then, this is often what is called as spiritual but not religious because people mm -hmm. feel that sometimes this traditional spirituality, if it does not address their needs. See, when people in today's world want to become spiritual, they say, now, they may not be interested in joining a particular tradition or right. they may not be necessarily looking for a particular, what a particular text teaches. What yeah. they want to see is how it adds value to my life. Right. So my understanding is at the intersection of all these three circles in this place, that is yes. where Krishna, we can find Krishna. Now we can just yeah. study, we can study the text and we can get lost in the text. We can uh, get we can we can practice the tradition, but we have the uh -huh. sacrificial brahmanas who were uh -huh. doing the traditional rituals, but they lost Krishna. Huh. And similarly, we can get we can get it called into applying, but again uh -huh. we can't lose Krishna. Wow. So ultimately, we want to come here in the center. Yeah, I like that. I want to be in the center with Krishna. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, in that area where Krishna is, I want to be where Krishna is. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, any thoughts about this? 
this yeah reviews? i think it's actually i i like that chart and i and i and i can see the three different perspectives that you 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 pointed out and uh, often we think of, of course our spirituality our krishna consciousness is one part of that you know and um integrating the three point parts sometimes seems overwhelming and confusing because there may seem to be some apparent contradictions apparent i'm going to say yeah. and that's why we have to go to that inner middle triangular part because that's where all the contradictions are resolved and integrated into a actually even though it's a smaller part it's actually a wider thing that encompasses all of it and and more so it, like that little part is the intersection but actually in that little part is the potential to over encompass all of those parts and more because krishna is everything and everywhere yeah that's beautiful actually know, that's yeah, just... so once you enter into that part it'll expand unlimitedly but yep yep so generally speaking it is expected that the text by the textual and the traditional will automatically get us to that center but sometimes right. we may not get there and similarly say when somebody is going into applied spirituality they can go into areas which are actually not connected with krishna also so that's yeah. also a danger Yeah, that yeah, also yeah. has to be avoided. Well, if you're going to follow the the bhakti tradition, yeah, I mean, if you want to follow another tradition, you have the choice to do that. But yes, if in bhakti yoga we want to really have a, a holistic perspective, hmm. we want to have a holistic perspective. It's just not a we want all of it, you know, because it gives more substance and uh, support for us. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. that note mata ji um uh. so things as practicing uh, devotees uh-huh. uh especially during the pandemic i've seen that uh, there have been a lot of tragedies that devotees have experienced upsets and so on in ourselves and in others also so yeah. how do we look at why these upsets are happening in spite of our devotional practices they're not happening in spite of our devotional practices they're actually happening because we're in the process of purification and these upsets are the things that have to come up that we really need to work on they're actually part of our spiritual development they wouldn't come up if they weren't something that needed to be worked on if it weren't there then we wouldn't need to work on it but if it's there it's something that still needs to be worked on if we're pure and equanimous and nothing upsets us there's nothing to work on but if upsets are coming up that means okay there you go there's your homework right in front of you does that does that make sense yep. it comes up because it, it's part of the process of like making the ghee the impurities come up to the top there they are now we can scrape them off before we couldn't see them because they were all interspersed with the ghee but now we can clearly see oh wow look at those impurities wow i didn't see them before there they are so does that mean that it is okay for devotees to understand the needs and feelings that they have and it's not a waste of time to focus uh, on the body and the mind when we should just focus only on the body <laughs> Well, I tried that route of uh of uh denying and neglecting the body for 27 years and I did a pretty good job, I must say. I produced a lot of results and um yeah, and I was a good devotee and I did all those things that a devotee is supposed to do the right way and after 27 years, oh my gosh, huge amounts of anger came up and i'm like what happened here so um <clears throat> i would say that you know how we do anything is how we do everything so if we're neglecting the asset of the body the body's actually an asset it's our boat to get us across the material ocean only in the human form of life can we actually reflect and uh you know uh choose and even transform our behaviors animals don't have that ability so this is this is an asset 
so it's really about you know managing our asset and using our asset and so we don't want to mistreat the asset if we mistreat it then we're not going to get the full use of it and we're not going to get the full effect of its potential we're going to be using only a small portion of it so the body it's our boat if we don't take care of our health you know okay we might die sooner and maybe we want to die sooner okay but is that what krishna wants you know they say that it's not a long life that makes you spiritual okay and it's not a short life that makes you spiritual either what does krishna want you know what does krishna want so taking care of our body is part of like respecting Oh, you gave me a gift, Krishna. Thank you very much. Let me take care of this. Don't I don't want to mistreat it. Let me take care of it. So that's the body. And as far, far, far as the feelings and the needs go, um, every I would I, I'll say that every attachment we have, we have attachments in the material world. We can call them, you know, addictions, anartas, you know, false ego, whatever we want to call them. We have attachments. All attachments are emotional. If they were logical, we could just read the Bhagavad Gita and say, oh, Bhagavad Gita says I should detach from the mind. Okay, that's logical. Let me just detach from the mind. It's simple. I need to detach from my mind. Let me just do that. Why can't I do that? Because I'm emotionally attached to my mind. So if we don't deal with our emotions, emotions and attachment are uh, very intimately connected, then I won't be able to really let go. And aversion is also emotional. When I'm averse to something, you can tell I'm averse to it. No, I don't like that. I no, I don't want that. I'm averse. You can feel my energy. You can feel my emotion. So Bhagavad Gita tells us we're not, we don't want to be attached or averse. These are both attachments. Attachments are emotional. If we don't deal with our emotions, we're not going to really be able to let go of our attachments. It's true of any addiction. If you see all addictions, people who are addicts, say someone is smoking cigarettes, they know they're killing themselves. They might be on their deathbed with lung cancer. I know people like this and they're smoking because they're attached. It's, it's, it's their way of relieving stress, but of course it caused more stress for the body, but they don't know how to deal with their stress or their feelings. So they just go to the quick fix, which kills, kills them. So we do this on different levels in different ways. We all have our addictions, whether subtle or gross. And the subtle ones are sometimes more dangerous than the gross ones because we can't see them. And so they hide for a while. Anyway, I talk mm -hmm. about some of this in my new, my new book. Yes, please, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. No, maybe you could, uh, I would like to reflect on some of what you said, but. Since you brought Please. it up, can you tell us a little bit about your book and when, what is it about? When is it likely to come out? Okay, well, the book was so long. It's called The Gap, Some Truth About the Lies We Tell Ourselves. And the book was so long that I was, it was suggested to me by a few devotees that I cut it in half. And I didn't quite know, sh I wasn't sure how to divide it. And so now I found a, a, a clean break in the topics. So the first part is about the mind and the false ego. And the second part is about the anartas and kind of how, how to deal with the anartas. So um, it, it clearly talks about all of these things that we're talking about in a um, analytical and a practical way to kind of give us a full scope of it. So that's like the short version of it. Oh, so the first book is called The Gap, Some Truth About the Lies We Tell Ourselves. And the part two is called Entering the Gap, More Truth About the Lies We Tell Ourselves. Okay. Okay, so, so that seems that this book is, uh, so 
this book is uh, a much more much more broader application as compared to say your book on compassion is focused on one thing now it is you are actually addressing the entire gamut of a of a devotee's life and how to how that a devotee can grow holistically as you mentioned earlier something it's 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 holistic and then it gets some specific parts but it's 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 um it covers a lot of topics and a lot of territory just to give kind of the holistic perspective and um yeah like yeah okay. i don't know exactly what i call it but yeah it has a lot there's a lot in it i tried to put it all in one book because i wanted to get it out of my head and on paper and anyway yeah so you know a couple of things what about what you mentioned earlier that generally even i when i grew up in my spiritual life there was a fear and a suspicion about reading any books other than our traditions books and that too even specifically prabhupada's books and the the fear is that one might get deviated by those reading those books that suspicion is that no these are not necessarily what uh, these are all people as now i'll put it in scare quotes karmis who have written it what do they know i know there was one self help book which uh, i had read before i was introduced to krishna consciousness and i i had found it very helpful at that time but when i started practicing bhakti and then i talked with a devotee about that book and the devotee's response was that person is a cow flesh eater do you think he can teach you anything of value so i didn't know how to respond to that at that time but uh, i felt i'm just giving that as a sample of the cursory way in which at one time uh, not only was all other wisdom considered uh, unnecessary but it was also seen as sometimes contaminating now i look back and see it's like a very short sighted way of looking at things but um, uh, what i have my answers about this but i would like to hear what 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 would, what do you think about this Well, I, I just like to say, in a practical matter, if we have a problem with our computer, right, we might take it to a computer expert. Now, in India, you have tons of devotees who are computer experts, so you might be able to take it to a devotee. Maybe in America, we don't have so many such things, but you might even take it to a computer store. Or if you have trouble with your phone, you might take it to the company where you got the phone, and they can help you to sort out things. um you have a construction problem you might not know a devotee who's into construction you might consult with a construction expert an engineer who knows how to do engineering you know maybe an architect who knows how to do design and if you have a medical problem or you broke your wrist and you don't know any devotee devotee doctors you might go to a doctor who can uh fix your broken bone so you know we don't have trouble um accessing information on these areas but somehow when we think it's interfering with our uh spiritual perspective we get a little nervous now to me um you know it it could get diverting if maybe you're um really young in your krishna conscious practice um it it could be diverting it's it's really all according to the our desire you know really krishna fulfills our desires so if we want to be diverted we can be in the temple and we'll still be diverted <laughs> and if we really don't want to be diverted we can read other books and they will maybe help us and not divert us it really is you know what's going on inside here um that being said one of the reasons another reason why i wrote the book is because the same thing I've come across I don't want to go to an outside you know uh to a uh uh consultant or a counselor or a coach who's not a devotee you know I don't want to talk to somebody who's not a devotee I don't want to talk to a therapist who's not a devotee so um there is something to be said about that at the same time there are some value that that they can offer and we got to know what they can offer you know and then what the limits are of what they can offer but the 
one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because I feel like, you know, at least devotees can maybe get some kind of idea of what's out there and what modalities might help for certain things that they might be experiencing. And, you know, they can feel that they have access through a devotee rather than, you know, just anybody. I don't know. I'm, not that I'm a devotee, but <laughs> I'm practicing. I'm trying. <laughs> so did that answer your question? Or is there more to it? Yes, yes definitely. So, you know, I, I also like, uh, tackle this issue because I studied engineering and some of the engineering, what I learned, not my specialized engineering, but overall, I'm using that knowledge in Krishna's service. So I learned English from a person who was a meat eater. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm using exactly. that in Krishna's service. So somehow exactly. it seems that if somebody has learned something before they come to Krishna consciousness, that's fine, use it. But after you come to Krishna consciousness, don't learn anything more. That doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Mm. So there, there are two things over there. There's a source, which I don't find a very substantive argument because... You know, uh, Chanakya Pandit also said that, and Prabhupada quoted that, you, know, you can take gold even from a filthy place. So even if somebody is that way, it doesn't matter. But now, coming to the point of the content, ah. that, see, there is a very clear understanding of the difference. Say, if my hand is fractured, uh -huh. uh, I, I obviously have to go to an orthopedic surgeon and get it repaired. As you said, or if my car is damaged or whatever, I have to do that. But when uh -huh. it comes to the domain of self-care, uh -huh. so that is, say, for example, when you consider especially the mind, not so much the body. Body, to some extent, we understand that we have to go to a doctor. So if, I do, if I have to manage my finances, I may have to go to a financial expert. If I have to decide where to invest or whatever. But when it comes to the mind, somehow, you know, in the material world, or I don't know, in the outside world, people equate the mind and the soul and they reduce it to the mind. That means people consider the spiritual and the mental to be the same. Most people then say, I want, to, I want to feel spiritual. They basically want to feel good. So right, they, right, right. they equate the soul with the mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas I mm -hmm. we in the moment go to the ext other extreme and uh -huh. equate the mind with the soul. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that means we think that by the spiritual practices, the mind should be automatically taken care of. And that would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so at a philosophical level, somehow I feel that the acknowledgement that the mind is a distinct level of reality and it has to be addressed in its own way, that understanding, that acknowledgement is lacking. And one yeah. reason for that is also that, say, we say that ma mantra, mantra, the literal meaning of the word mantra is that which frees the mind from anxiety, yes. from misery. Yes. yes. So we expect, at least from the very definition of the mantra, which is our core sadhana, we expect that the, 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 the spiritual practices like chanting should relieve our mind. And that's why it feels a little bit... Uh, not a little bit, for many people it feels quite a bit of uh, conflict when that which our spiritual wisdom is meant to address, if for that we need to go to somewhere else. Can I interrupt here? Yeah, please. Okay. So if mantra is going gonna, is gonna to free the mind, okay? So let me take the example of ghee. So when we heat the ghee, the, the, the heat is like the mantra. So we're heating the ghee. So the heating of the ghee frees the impurities to come to the top. Okay, great. If we don't scrape them off, where do, we, where do they go? How do we get the purity? How do we get the pure ghee? We have to scrape them off. So we got to learn a little bit about the practice of once the impurities come up, like where do we put them? What do we do with them? The mantra is bringing up the impurities great but if we don't scrape them off and then we stir it up again boom <laughs> we have to learn the process of you know removing those impurities is, is that 
Was that an appropriate example? Yeah, I like that. So, Gaur Kumar Prabhu, feel free at any time again. Thanks. Yeah. So, we were talking about judging, um, uh, but also in terms of uh, devotees, I've seen that, uh, especially by living in communities, devotees tend to judge others a lot, even within the community. Uh, how do we go around it? Uh, I've been a victim and I've also been one of the causes also. I've also judged others. So how do we go around it, Mataji? I mean, this is something that we've all struggled. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to go around it, but the nature of the mind is to judge. That That's part of its design. It's supposed to judge what's hot, what's cold, what's dangerous, what's safe, what's edible, what's not edible, you know, what's clean, what's not clean, you know, it, it's meant to judge. So it, it, it has a use. Um, however, of course, just like anything in the material world, it gets carried away. And then not only our judgment of things, our judgment of ourselves and our judgment of people becomes like an absolute. Now, you know, a chair is a chair and it's made of maybe wood and fabric, okay? Maybe a little metal. It doesn't have too much more than that. A soul in a human being, we don't even know who that soul is. We don't know what their relationship with Krishna is. We don't know who they are. And we're kind of just judging by the outside package or some habits they may have from their past conditioning. And when we put them in a box, we kind of encage them. We don't allow them to outgrow that, you know? Um, and we are not really associating with them. We're associating with their conditioning. So we're not really associating with them. And generally we judge others because we also judge ourselves. And, you know, there's a difference between self-awareness mm, and self-reflection and self-judgment. There's a complete different energy there. Judgment is a, a beating, like there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with you. Uh, reflection, observation uh, uh, might be, oh, um, that's interesting. Um, that didn't seem to work. Or I wonder what they're really trying to say so we can be curious. So that's one of my favorite quotes. Um, rather than being judgmental, be curious. Why did you say that? And, and what made you think that I was that way when you said and you called me this name? What was it that I did that had you say that? Because I'm interested to know if my action is bringing up that assessment in you, you know, maybe I need to look at how I was behaving. But if you don't give me the specific behavior, I can't do anything with it. It's just a label which doesn't give me any access to transform myself. I can't really take your feedback. So, you know, if we if we couch our, our judgments, not couch them, but if we expand our assessments into maybe feedback, well, I, I'm seeing this, I'm, I'm wondering where that's coming from, or is that what you meant to say? Or can you be a little more specific? We can get clarity and it doesn't, then, our, then, our, then whatever our judgment, our mind was saying, we can see a, a wider, a broader perspective of it. So our judgment is like a little straw that we see through. And when we look through our little straw, we only see a little bit. And then when we open up to curiosity, we can see a bigger picture. Oh, I didn't know that your father died. No wonder you're so upset today. I didn't know that this was happening at home. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. And oh my gosh, I didn't know that you were abused as a kid. I didn't know, oh my gosh, I didn't, I had no idea what was going on in your world. And I didn't know that this was your first lifetime in Krishna consciousness. Oh my gosh. And I didn't know that you had all, we don't really know, but our judgment gives us the illusion that I know how Gore Kumar is. I know about him. He's like this and this and this. 
or I know how I am. I've been living with myself long enough to know I'm like this, this, and this. Rather than I am and you are this, I have habits of getting excited when I talk, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> so I have habits of getting excited when I talk. People could make another judgment and say another thing about that. But we have habits and we all have habits. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's, yeah. it's, I'm really enjoying this discussion, I have to say. That's why I'm getting so excited. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I would like to, Gaur thank you for that question. Thank you for that answer. You know, I would just like to relink this very beautiful analysis of judgment and curiosity back to the earlier point about self-help, huh? what we're mentioning. I mm -hmm. feel that sometimes uh, uh, we, in, as human beings, we have an innate tendency to judge. And sometimes our devotional practices or our, or our spiritual philosophy actually increases and even equips that judgmental tendency. Ah, huh. that yeah, means, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, if somebody is say, struggling to do a particular thing, then we have quick answers. You are in Maya. Or, you know, you are, you are like this, you are like that, you are spaced out. You are this, you are that. Mm. Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. we, 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 in fact, what happens is, it's almost like every devotee becomes like a, we could say like a free consultant. They tell what is the diagnosis and they tell what is the prescription. You know, you are in Maya, you know, chant more attentively or do this or do that. And then that actually, when that happens, we feel, we feel ununderstood. If yeah, there is a word uh, like uh, that, mis ununderstood. Mis mis misunderstood. Yeah. Not uh, understood. Yeah, that's true. Misunderstood, but yeah, misunderstood. Uh, yeah, that's that's better actually. Yeah, we feel misunderstood, and then we also close up, and mm. then it leads to a lot of loneliness also. Mm. So we have certain needs which uh, is, is, uh, which are not being addressed, or at mm. least whatever somebody is telling, it's like I have a disease, and that prescription I've already tried it; it's not working for me. Right. So right. then it it actually closes a person up quite a bit. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So how do, what do you think about this point that how do we use our Krishna conscious philosophy to move toward curiosity in our interaction with each other and not toward judgment with each other? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, there is, um, there is a need in our judgment. So there's a couple of needs in our judgment. First of all, we want to have some certainty, like we all like certainty that fulfills our need for security. We all have a need for security, right? So we come upon the absolute truth. Oh my gosh, I have the answers. I have the absolute truth. Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. It's the absolute truth. And we, we, we like certainty and we like to be right. We want to have the right answer. We don't want to have the wrong answer. We don't want to be wrong. So we have the absolute truth. So that certainty and that absolute truth give us some security. I know. Knowing and having that I know, I know what to do. I know what the answer is. I know what the right answer is. It gives us a sense of security. So that fulfills our need for security. So that's why we kind of sometimes are attached to, you know, that, that that um, absolute truth in a certain way, in, a, in, in it perceived in a certain way. And of course, security is emotional. <laughs> so we can't just let it go. So so then um, um, so that was your one point about judgment. Now you said people give you know free advice because, we don't like to see other people in pain and we don't like to be in pain. Nobody wants to be in pain. So as devotees, we don't want people to be in pain. And hey, I got the answer there. This is the absolute truth Krishna says. Srila Prabhupada says, this is, this is gonna you know, you know, help you. We don't like to see other people in pain and we don't like to be in pain, but we become attached 
to quick fixes. Now, when we first come to Krishna consciousness and we first start chanting and we first start associating with devotees, oh my God, it's, it's a brand new world. We're in the spiritual world. It's like, wow, you don't meet people like this. You don't come across energy like this. This is like, this is a whole new world. And you're like, this is awesome. However, um, as we progress in Krishna consciousness, it's, it's, um, it's not a quick fix. So we come to Krishna consciousness, we're in so much mystery. We're in misery, we're suffering, right? How many people come to Krishna consciousness because they're suffering? I did, you know, <laughs> of course I was yeah. looking for some knowledge and some information. I wanted the truth, but so we come and we get some instant relief. Oh my gosh, it feels so good to understand and to know what's going on and know the truth. Feels so good. But then Krishna says, well, there's a little more work for you to do because Krishna consciousness is not a quick fix. You can't paste Krishna consciousness on top of your conditioning. You're going to have to deal with that other stuff that's going to come up when you turn up the heat. When you chant the mantra and turn up the heat, the impurity is going to come out. You're going to have to do something with that. So um, mm, the, the initial uh, truth it, it can't necessarily, um, it's not a quick fix. It's, it's an integrated process and we have to see, okay, I'm using a slotted spoon that might take off some of the bigger parts of the impurities of the ghee, but oh my gosh, then the little impurities are still in the thing. Now I have to use a, a strainer. I might have to use a strainer. I might have to use different tools and I might not have all the tools I'm needing. So it becomes, as we stay in Krishna consciousness longer, it becomes, you know, more challenging. We need to, uh, you know, really see how we can, in reality, deepen our Krishna consciousness, not as a quick fix, not as a quick answer, but as a integrated process that actually really works. Now, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I mean, you definitely address a lot of points. Be, yeah, the, there is one uh, uh, one issue that what we are saying is that all these are resources. If I understood you right, is that these are resources for applying the practices of Krishna consciousness. Yes, so it's yes, not. Yes. So it could potentially <clears throat> uh, it could potentially uh, uh, be a be a hazard it could potentially deviate us but like you said earlier that anything can deviate us anything. if somebody wants to be deviated even within a temple without absolutely. doing any other activity they can get deviated absolutely so now the if we say these are our resources for applying so does that mean that our own uh, say the movement and the tradition doesn't provide these resources because again, going back to that earlier earlier point about the mind, we tend to equate the mind with the soul, whereas as I say, outside people equate the soul with the mind. So, uh -huh. so now, could it be that? Uh, so I thought a little bit, and I'll I'll share some of my thoughts, and then you can add or uh, clarify or correct whatever. I feel that that we are practicing. When we, we conceive of the tradition, we have like a very narrow vision of the tradition. The tradition mm. was a community. Tradition was a way of living. Mm. And uh, the tradition was practiced, say, mostly in rural or small town kind of settings mm. where people were uh -huh. together. Yes. Now we live in a much more fragmented society. Yes. The conflict between, I think that for each devotee, there are three conflicts that they have to ne negotiate. Okay. One is the conflict between us and the broader society around us. Okay. This conflict is much bigger today than what was in the past. Uh huh. Because it's a bigger community. Not just a bigger community. I would say the uh, society is also much more materialistic now. Oh yes, 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 yes. If you yes, look at the tradition, yes. even when yes. Chaitanya just five hundred years ago. Yes. Even if we consider that people were not worshiping Krishna. 
but still it says that they were all there were people who were you know, worshiping other devtas they were reading the bhagavad yes, yes 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 so yes 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 it's more degraded now yeah yeah okay yeah so then second is that the conflict between the present me and the past me that's uh-huh. also very big because uh-huh. of which, because of which the kind of conditionings we have to deal with are far more complicated then what what say a person in the past from a purer background uh-huh. might have had to deal with them uh-huh. yeah they lived a simpler life <clears throat> yeah so, and third is also that <clears throat> now we in one sense when we are practicing bhakti uh, especially if we are living in a community where we are practicing bhakti then it's and i'm not just a community if you say if you are living in a temple or close to a temple then it's mm-hmm. almost like our multiple roles are mixed up it's is it our home or is it our workplace ah uh, it's both or is it our place of worship oh yeah that's good you know yeah, yeah prabhupa i think prabhupa said about you know prabhupa also differentiated i think vrindavan is my my what did he say vrindavan is my home mayapur yes. is my place of worship and mumbai uh-huh. is my office aha uh-huh. aha uh-huh. so yeah beautiful so i think because of all these tensions Yeah. the problems with the mind are much more today than what they were in the past and in the tradition also maybe there were certain resources which were available mm. which we mm-hmm. don't know about now yes yes because yes because yes. complete this point yes, sir uh, when i have read a little bit about not just the uh, not just uh, the the vedic tradition but also other religious traditions one of the things they said is that a large part of the wisdom was passed down through the oral tradition mm-hmm. and in the past writing books was much more difficult it was not so easy and a few people only wrote books uh-huh. so what happened was shri prabhupad in a sense had to in the written word give not only what was traditionally given in the written word but also what was taught through the oral tradition yeah and that oral tradition Prabhupada did a remarkable job what he did in his books, but still, Absolutely. the oral tradition was huge. Yeah, and yeah. all those supports which were there in society, which were mm-hmm. like presumed to be available for practitioners. Right. right. Now we are living in a place where they are not available. Right. So if we could get all these self-care supports from mm-hmm. within the tradition, that's fine. Aha. Uh-huh. But if uh-huh. we don't get it, we uh-huh. need to get it from somewhere. Right, and wherever we get it from, we take it and move forward, move ahead. Ah, I I really like that perspective that you really showed. Like even previously, there was Varnashram Dharma, and there was more apprenticeship and training, and um, you know, more role models. And now we're more divided and separated and segregated, and um, you know, individualized and less even extended families, and you know, it's a lot more stress. on the individual to um <laughs> work on things another point is that our movement as it is as propod brought it to us is you know a little over 50 years old it's it's a still a relatively new movement and yeah. so you know for us to like we're just now thinking about what to do about elder care because now we have elders and previously we didn't whereas now a lot of traditions like the the christian and the protestant church they have old uh they have um elder care facilities independent living facilities associated with the church you know they have um you know um programs for uh adolescents and teenagers and you know it's it's highly developed because they have so many more resources and they have so much more time and actually experience about what's working and what's not working and we've started you know building expanding making temples and we've done a lot of the external spending expanding the external work to set up the foundation of the institution and mm. n- now it's time to go in and do the internal work that maybe we didn't have the time to do and which is going to create sustainability So, you know, when you make a structure, 
you know, it's not just throwing something together. You want something that's going to be sustainable. So we have the big basic foundation and we need to implement things that will make the process sustainable, will make uh, over time and it will allow devotees, you know, resources to um, to address uh, different issues that maybe we haven't as an institution addressed. And I would say that that's more institutional than traditional because as an institution, we're a fairly new institution. So th does that make sense? Because, you know, you've got a tradition, but now you've got a new institution, which has to function in new ways. So we're kind of still just developing. Does that make any beautiful, sense? Beautiful. I think that uh, we sometimes conflate the institution with the tradition. Huh. The, tra the tradition huh. is like the institution is a current expression of the tradition. Yes. And the tradition is had many more resources which right. we as an institution now need to create. Yeah. Yes, yes, and also, yes. And, and relevantly, it, it has to be relevant to the time, place and circumstance. Yeah, that's true. You know, Prabhupada also, he did at one time talk about churning. Now it's the time to churn the milk. We have, we have enough devotees now, we need to churn the milk. Now what he meant by that... That was in 1972 he said that. Yeah. So now Absolutely. what he meant by that and how it was going to be done, you know, he didn't, uh, at least from what I have read, uh, he didn't give specific guidelines, but he did recognize that means, means what his point was that what we have been doing right now is not churning the milk. There is something which we need to do to churn the milk, which is basically, you could say, like you said earlier, that there is the external expansion and there is, we could say, the inner expansion of our consciousness. Mm, which yeah. uh, which uh, we need to which I like the point of external and internal because sometimes even for the external expansion of our of, of our movement we draw on various resources like if you are going to build a temple we don't just necessarily have only devotees we have professional architects absolutely so, so just as for the external expansion of our movement we may draw resources from various places yeah and we may similarly for our internal expansion also why not why not? Why are we going to have to reinvent? Do we have to reinvent the wall? Do we have to learn how to make computers ourselves? Do we have to reinvent everything? People have already spent a lot of time and energy developing Krishna's sciences. These are Krishna's sciences. These are Krishna's resources. They've spent a lot of focus just on one aspect of it. Why don't we take that and use it? It saves us a lot of time. It saves us so much time. We don't have to develop them from scratch. They're, they're already developed. If they're Krishna's principles and Krishna's sciences, computer science is Krishna's science. We have no trouble using Krishna's computer science. Was it a devotee that designed computer science? No, but these are all sciences. They're actually all Krishna's sciences. I really like how you're trying to integrate everything, Mataji. And yeah. One, one of the challenges that I've faced when I've okay. approached people is to take up this path of self-care. The immediate uh -huh. question is, is this self-care going to help me nourish my devotion? That is the first question I get. And if I yeah. say, no, work on yourself, it will eventually help you nourish your devotion, then they become a little doubtful. Oh, if uh -huh. it's not going to help me in my chanting, then why uh -huh. waste time in self-care? So my question, uh -huh. can I nourish my devotion more by practicing self-care? Okay. Well, it is an integrated thing. We are an integrated machine and everything is actually intimately connected. Mm -hmm. And so self-care is actually vital to our spiritual life because what is the self we're caring for? Who is the self we're caring for? If we think the self is the body, we're already, you know, in a misconception because it's not just about the body, but this external is, is a temple, which is housing the soul and the super soul. So will we not want to take care of this? Do we not take care of Krishna's temples? Do we not clean Krishna's temples? Did Lord Chaitanya not clean the Gundicha temple? 
over and over and over again. That's the inner cleanse that we 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 are it's necessary for us to do. So self-care. So th this is what I write in my book. So I'm giving you a little trailer here. So um, we all need care, right? We all need care. We're not we're, we're, we're persons, we're individuals. We all need some kind of care. We need to eat. We need to sleep. We need care. So if we don't care for ourselves, then what? Then somebody's going to have to take care of us. If I don't prepare my meals or I don't go to the temple where there is a meal or I don't go to the store or go to the garden and pick something, if I don't do anything to take care of myself, someone's going to have to come and make food and put it in my mouth and care for me. So if I don't care for myself, then I'm kind of putting a burden somewhere on somebody else to care for me. So that's one thing. And, and who am I responsible for caring for? I mean, Krishna did give me this soul. He made me as a soul and he gave me this body. In reality, this is the, this is the soul and the self that I am responsible for caring for. So if I don't care for myself, I'm kind of putting a burden on somebody else to care for me. That's one thing. Now, another thing is, even in the airplane, they say, if the oxygen level goes down, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you try, try to take care of somebody else. So why do they say that? Because we human beings don't do that. We neglect ourselves. And then if you're trying to take care of somebody else and fix somebody's oxygen mask on and it's not working, but you don't have your oxygen mask on yourself, you lose your oxygen, you lose your consciousness, and then you can't, you die and you can't help the other person anyway. What's the point? So if I can't take care of myself uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, what do I have to give to another person? You know, I'm distracting myself from my real job. So the problem is that devotees sometimes think self-care is selfish. They equate the two, but they're completely not the same. Right. Selfish right. means I have no, I, I don't have the exact quote. Let me think. Selfish means I have no regard for others. Self-absorbed means, no, self-absorbed, selfish means I have no regard for others. I can't remember the other one. Self, something means I have no regard for myself. So I, we, it's not that we have no regard for ourselves or that we have no regard for others, but it has to be, it, it has to be, um, integrated. We can't have no care for ourselves and have any ability to actually care for others because this is our job. This is what we've been given. So we, we, we need to care for both ourselves and then we can, we have the, the, the facility and the capacity to care for others. It gives us a sustainable platform from which to work. There's more I put in the book. I think I put four points I'm in the middle of editing it and there's so much. So I forgot ex exactly the four points, but it's in there. You know, how there's a difference between being selfish and self-aware. Self yeah, self-aware. I think that's what it is, selfish and self-aware. Self-aware is, you know, you know, I, anyway, I can't remember exactly. So I don't want to get it mixed up. Does that, did that help? Was that? Yeah, yeah, um, but you have more. Like, Go ahead. Like my uh, specific question is: like, uh, will self care eventually make ah. a better devotee? Like a better, uh, like go a deep better to okay. Yeah, yeah. What's gonna make us? We can't make ourselves a better devotee. <laughs> That's Krishna's job, <laughs> but we can take. Um, our time and consciousness to help clear the impurities and not put more impurities in. So self-care is kind of continually cleaning, cleansing the Ganducha temple, scraping off the, um, the impurities. So that's 
that's what self-care is about. We're caring for the self inside, ultimately, but we have to care for the body too, because that, that's where the self inside lives. And if the mind is agitated, how is it going to sit and chant and receive the mercy of the holy name? If it's going all over the place, it's, it's not going to be able to hear and, and, and even receive the power of the holy name. So we got to do something with it. <laughs> we got to somehow deal with it. So if we don't, it's not a mechanical process, you know? The mechanics get us a certain level, but at some point it's got to be integrated because it's all connected. I really like uh, that... what you said about yeah, I really liked what you said about cleaning the impurities in our mind so that we can welcome Krishna in our minds. So that we can chant more peacefully. And receive, and receive, receive and be, be present. Otherwise, our mind's going to be here and there and here and there and here and there, worried about this, worried about that. We got to deal with that. And our emotions, too. Our emotions, our, our attachments and our aversions. If we don't deal with them, we are we're attached to this material world. We're staying here. You can't, just like the monkey with the, the what is it, the sweet balls or something inside the the jar, right? You can't, you know, you can't get your hand out. You can't get the sweet balls out unless you let go. So, you know, we're going to be stuck in this material world if we don't learn how to let go of our attachments, which are all emotional. They're emotional. So we're going to have to deal with our emotions somewhere along the line. Was that helpful? Thank you. Mm, okay. Helpful. Yeah. Hi, Definitely. You know, what I... What I'm realizing increasingly is that maybe we have ourselves created a dichotomy where we have reduced the ambit of bhakti to certain things. Uh -huh. That means bhakti means say, chanting the holy names. Bhakti means worshipping the deities. Uh -huh. But bhakti uh -huh. is also inclusive. You know, anything that helps us in the service of Krishna is bhakti. Absolutely. So, like Prabhupada, I remember in the Lilamrath, when the devotees had a lot of difficulty in getting uh, cement for building the Vrindavan temple. Huh. And finally, they got cement. Uh -huh. So, there is the Prabhupada was so care. Prabhupada was standing there and he was monitoring how it's happening. And then he told the devotee, be very careful that don't let the cement be stolen. And in the Lamrath, it is written that Prabhupada was, was treating each cement bag as if it was like a gold bag. <laughs> so, yeah, it was. So, you know, so if, if counting cement bags can be bhakti, then say trying to understand our emotions and trying to understand our needs and taking care of that, why can't that be bhakti? Isn't it? Yeah, because bhakti is not the externals. Bhakti is consciousness. Bhakti is our consciousness. So... We want to be able to see Krishna everywhere and in everything and how to utilize, you know, how to utilize. Krishna made everything with a use. Now, we may not be utilizing everything, but everything does have a use. Hmm. So are we using, are we using our body and our mind? Are we allowing our mind to use us? Are we allowing our emotions and our anger and our, our anartas to, to, and our false ego to take over and control us? Or are we directing, if we don't take responsibility and we're not self-aware, we're going to be on autopilot. And if we're on autopilot, you know, the automated systems of defense and false ego, they're taking us away. We, our consciousness has to be invested in in, 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 the, in the whole process, our consciousness has to be there. It's not a mechanical process. This is a very striking way of phrasing it, that if we don't use our emotions, they will use us. They will. I like, I like the word, I like the specific word use over here, because use also means there's yukta vairagya. That, you know, we talk about how use material things with detachment. Yes. So even we, we don't want to get entangled by them, but we don't also yes. want to reject them. Right. So just as the right. like you, you talked earlier about the computer being used. Yes, yes. So similarly, if we consider our emotions are very, very definitive 
because are impo- uh, are very important for in shaping who we are and what we do so uh-huh. it's almost like if i don't want to use a computer i can choose not to use a computer it may make right. my life a little difficult but i can uh-huh. very well do without a computer uh-huh. but the computer is external to me yes it's much more difficult for me to say i won't use my emotions the emotions <laughs> yeah, are already are. there yes. and it it is if i don't use my emotions they are not just going to stay silent they are going to be there and they are going to act and they will make me act in unhealthy ways so in that sense they will use me and and i can i bring a point in here about emotions yeah please because it has a lot to do with compassion and communication emotions are information emotions are feedback emotions are really wanting to show us there is some need inside of us that needs is is is, is not being addressed Emotions are just like signals like on the dashboard of a car. The light flashes, you need some gas or you need some oil. You know, if we if we don't listen to the 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 signals, you know, in in our subtle emotional body, it's going to end up being in our physical body, we're going to be sick, and then the messages are going to be getting louder, and if we neglect those messages that are coming through the feelings in our body, then we're going to have a lot more work to do which is really going to distract us from our krishna consciousness so we want to take the information that the the emotions are giving us oh wow there's some need here that's not being addressed how can i address this and work on this and take care of it okay but if you don't work on it your homework piles up <laughs> and then after 30 years of being in krishna consciousness like me boom Okay, here you go. Here's your bill. You haven't been paying your bills for 30 years. Now, here comes the toll. Take care of it. So, yeah. That's so beautiful. It's interesting because one of the core aspects of bhakti that we are taught initially is that you have to mm-hmm. be humble and you have to uh-huh. be forgiving. Humility. Humble and, and what? And forgiving. You have to be very oh, forgiving. Oh, forgiving. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah, so these are two things that we have they are always taught, but uh uh-huh. how can we distinguish between genuine feelings of humility within us and tendencies of beating up the self so when someone oh. tells us that we tend to neglect our needs and then we right. keep saying, we keep beating ourselves up oh i'm not humble right. i'm not humble i'm not forgiving right. i'm not forgiving right 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 yes so right. how do we distinguish between the genuine humility and this feeling that we get okay that's a very good question i would like to say humility is a is a very 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 high virtue and um i just start with trying to be honest so if we can't be really honest we're not humble <laughs> so i just try to be honest because humility is very a high virtue now in regards to self beating you know that's that's you know that's one of the the illusions you know self beating You know, where does it say in scripture that we're supposed to like be so mean to ourselves? If we're mean to ourselves, you know, how are we going to be towards other people? So, you know, um self-beating is actually a distraction. It's a distraction from the real issue. So, I made a mistake. Why am I beating myself up because I'm not pure? I made a mistake. Well, I'm Jeeva Tatva. I made a mistake. Can I simply go admit the mistake? clean it up and move forward. No, I can't do that. I have to hide the mistake. I'm too shameful. I feel really bad about myself. That's not humility. That's shame. That's not humility. That's shame. <coughs> so, um humility is a really high topic. Let's work on um let's work on honesty and just being honest. and then the other one um so so self beating is really it takes a lot of energy so just say um <clears throat> you have you have this much energy in your hand right so you can use this energy to produce some result positively or you can use this energy against yourself so how does it feel when we beat ourselves up we're using our energy and then we're feeling discouraged i'm so fallen i'm so stupid i'm so that's low self esteem that's not humility so we're using our energy against ourselves you know pushing ourselves down and then we have no energy to like focus on chanting because we're so busy feeling how awful we are 
and we're not awful. That's an illusion. We are part and parcel of Krishna. We may have habits which have some flavor of awfulness to them, but we are not awful. And then there's the other habit of, there's the other virtue of respect. This is a big one. So um, respect, Lord Chaitanya's third Chikshastakam prayer, right? We should offer all respect to you others know, can, and not expect. I'm can, sorry, can, go can, ahead. Because you know, you're talking a lot about humility and I okay. feel we could maybe like un unpack this a little bit. Okay, okay, let's unpack it. Thank you. Yeah, so this is, this is a lot to think about. So first thing I felt, or based on what the thought that came to me, and Gorkamar Prabhu also spoke this, that actually when we talk about humility, sometimes we talk about humility almost in a sense that we blot ourselves out of existence. Absolutely. Like in, it's it's humility doesn't mean that I devalue myself or I deny myself completely. It means that something like I value something bigger than myself that I want to serve Krishna and for serving Krishna, I want to care for myself because it is I who am going to serve Krishna. But sometimes humility ac acquires a very negative focus where yes. so yeah. if somebody has, uh, if somebody has dis hurt me, insulted me, disrespected me. And then on top of that person says, you know, if you are humble, you wouldn't feel hurt by that. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Who are they hurting? The soul doesn't get they, hurt, so it's the body and the mind? Right. I, I'd say the false ego. Okay. They're hurting the false ego. That's not really who we are. They're hurting our false sense of ourself. And if we're hurting our self, self self-respect is taking care of our real self. We're taking care of our real self. If we're denigrating ourself, we can't have self-respect for the soul and denigrate at the same time. It's so conflictual and it just creates so much blah, conflict, you know? So are you saying that by this analysis, uh, I, should, I should not feel hurt? Or is this more like an intellectual analysis to decrease the amount of the hurt or what are you trying to say by this okay what i'm trying to say is <laughs> if, if they're hurting me they're not really hurting me they're hurting my false ego so i need to look at what am i identifying with if i'm identifying with my false ego that's actually my issue <laughs> it's my misidentification it's an upadi so if i'm attached to an upadi that i am this and they're hurting that and that's not me. That's a lie. So I'm mad at you for hurting something that's not really me. That's my problem. That's my misidentification. Does that make sense? That's a very, it's on a deeper level, but. Yeah, I know it's a deeper level. Somehow this seems to almost run, I would say, contrary to all that you have been speaking till now. Okay. Maybe. Because till now what we have been speaking is. Yeah, our emotions. Well, if I if I really is at the level where I could say that I'm different from my false ego or I'm different from my mind, then I wouldn't need all this. That's right. So we need to do both things simultaneously. It's a two 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 real process. So we need to say, okay. So when you said this, I felt hurt. You know what did I need? So when we get to the need underneath the hurt then we get more to the reality of the situation. Mm. So they're not, you know, they're, they're, whatever they're saying is, is hitting an emotion which has a need underneath it. Okay? So we want to look at what is that need underneath that, that they're mm. hitting. That's the important part here. And when we identify the need, that's closer to who we are as a soul Whereas otherwise we're defending our false ego, which is not who we really are. So we got to do both things at the same time because you can't really defend your false ego and identify your need of your soul simultaneously because they have slightly different needs sometimes. Does that make sense? 
it's kind of got to be a two-way process. You got to go back and forth and back and forth. You want to give empathy and identify your feelings and your needs. At the same time, sometimes you got to, you know, be straight. You know, you're hurting me. Well, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said, no one can harm you unless you harm yourself. So if I'm identifying with my false conception of who I am, I'm harming myself. And then I'm blaming you for harming me. You so know, I, I like this point of working on both levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> so going back to an earlier point where you said we can okay. see emotion as information. Yes. Yes. So if I go back to considering the mind as another level of reality, like the body. Okay. So if somebody while walking along, they're walking the temple, they are going toward the deities, but they're stepping on uh -huh. my foot. Okay. And I feel pain. Okay. Yeah. So then yeah. that pain is information that something is wrong. Yes. Now, yes. similarly, yes. if somebody is walking over me, yes. not physically, but emotionally, emotionally, yeah, then I feel pain. Yes. So, <clears throat> so at one level, when they're walking over my foot, I am the soul and I'm different from my foot. Yes. Yes. So yes. It, it, so in a sense, I can say they're not hurting me. But yes, in another yes. sense, they are actually hurting me because I have, yes. ultimately yes. I have to use this body in serving Krishna. And if my leg is injured, I won't be able to serve Krishna. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Or like another point yes, is that yes, instead yes, of not yes, only yes. will I not okay. be able to serve Krishna, probably somebody else will have to serve me. Somebody, if I don't take care of my needs, somebody else will uh -huh. have to take care of my needs. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So same way we yeah. can say. So I'd like to so, say. So just one minute, okay. I'll complete my point. Then yeah, finish, 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 so finish, when you finish, said finish. that uh, uh, that if somebody is hurting me, it's actually they're hurting my false ego, not me. So this uh -huh. kind of distancing sh should not mean that I'll continue to let them hurt me. It's like somebody right. st standing on my foot doesn't mean that right. oh, I'm not the body, so let them stand on my foot. Right. So we have to do the needful to protect ourselves while at yes. the same time, and, and we could say one part of protecting ourselves is say dealing with the external situation. Another part yes. of protecting ourselves is also to deal with the internals by understanding. Actually, yes. they're not hurting yes. me. But uh -huh. right now, because my consciousness is invested in my mind, so I have to yes. deal with the situation. Yes. That's a that's a very good explanation for it. Yes. And they're both they're both there because you know we, we want to be able to take some personal responsibility. So there is pain in the world. So somebody steps on my toe, there is pain. Yes, you're stepping on my toe. Excuse me, you stepped on my toe. Oh, I'm sorry. But then there could be suffering. You're so unconscious. You're so mean. I could add so much stuff and that's suffering. You hurt me. You're mean. You don't like me. You're disrespecting me. I can add so many layers to it. So there needs to be a little bit of, of emotions as information, but then we got to understand that sometimes that judgmental mind adds a lot of extra information, which is associated more with the false ego than the real situation that's going on. So does that make sense? Did that oh, help or did that make it? Yeah, go ahead. You... Yeah. So you're saying that Tell emotions can got. both inform and misinform. So we have to find out well, what the is mind, actually important. The mind misinterprets the emotion. So the emotion is really giving us the information of the need. And then the mind adds interpretations and assumptions and expectations and conclusions, which may have nothing to do with what's really happening. And that may be associated with the false ego. So we need to kind of, you know, clearly see, you know, what is what is what. <laughs> so you're stepping on my foot. Yes. You know, you're mean and nasty and disrespectful. And that that's another issue. So we want to be able to address both of those at the same time. Mm. You know, that... I, wrote, I, wrote, I wrote one of my books on like quotes based on the Gita. You helped me to edit that also quite yeah. comprehensively. So there, I think there's one quote that just came to my mind that 
I wrote this. Huh. Intelligence means to understand how our mind makes us misunderstand. Aha, uh -huh. that's right. That's a good one. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, so yes. it's, a, it's a very beautiful point that, so like say if I'm angry, uh, uh -huh. so I could just, uh, if we apply that earlier point of judging ourselves and like you said, sh shaming ourselves. Yes. And if I'm feeling angry, it simply means I'm a short-tempered person. I have so many anarthas. Or right, if, right. If, if, if you feel greed or lust or whatever, just say, okay, I'm such a fallen person because I have this, these particular anarthas. But instead right. of that, okay, if I feel angry, I see that what, what is it that is actually making me angry? And then... Yeah, what do I need? Okay. So now here you need to Yeah, I might I need, need I might need some consideration. I might need some um some compassion. I might need some understanding. But uh, I'm, there are so many things that I might need it. So what you I'm sorry, I interrupted your thought. Not inter I interrupted you actually. Sorry about that. But I just saying that say if somebody okay, okay now. if somebody disrespects me, well, isn't it straightforward that my need is that you should respect me? So what is there to well, like, explore within that? Okay, so if I'm angry, I may have a need for respect, but I might have a need for understanding. It, it's, you know, you want to fine tune it because if you just say you should respect me, you're disrespecting me, you're making an offense, it, it doesn't really get to the the uh, the richness and the depth of, of really what's going on inside of me and, and what's going on inside of you. You know, you may have a need to be heard and, you know, maybe I interrupted you and you feel like I disrespected you when actually I was, who knows, you know. So getting getting to the needs helps us to get more clarity. The mind tends to go to instant assumptions and conclusions based on our past, which may not actually be what's happening right now. Mm. So you know, we want to be present and clear what's going on right now. And a lot of times when we're upset with something, we think we're upset because you stepped on my toe, but actually I'm upset because five years ago, you screamed at me in front of people. Three years ago, you uh, took away my service. Two years ago, you called me a name. One year ago, you ignored me and now you're stepping on my toe. <laughs> so all that may be piled together in my uh, conclusion about what happened when you stepped on my toe. So, yeah, I really like that answer, Mataji. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about this. So when someone disrespects us, how do we forgive them? Like, uh, Immediately, our mind starts saying, you did this to me, you did this to me, you hurt me, you caused me pain. So how do we let go of that feeling, of that emotion by forgiving them? Uh, I know that uh, forgiveness is also talked a lot about in our scriptures, but when it comes to practice, it's actually extremely difficult. And I've seen devotees and myself struggle with it. So how do we learn to forgive? Forgive ourselves well, and forgive ourselves. Yes. Well, first of all, when I say you disrespected me, you hurt me, I am putting all the blame over on you. So first of all, whatever you did to have me say that you disrespected me, actually, what I'm trying to say is I have a need for respect. Hmm. You may have had no intention of disrespecting me. Maybe your intention was to help me and you were just trying to give advice. And the way you gave advice to me, I felt like you were disrespecting me, but that wasn't your intention. So me saying you disrespected me is not necessarily the truth. So when I look at it, taking personal responsibility, I can say, when you said you need to uh, look in the mirror at yourself, I felt hurt because I have a need for respect, you know, and understanding. Could you tell me what you meant when you said that? Uh, yeah, you got some spaghetti on your face. Oh, I didn't see that. Thank you very much for the feedback. 
Now, people may say it with a certain tone of voice, which we may remind us of the way one of our parents talked to us. And we may still be emotionally scarred from the way we were treated by our parents. And so if you say, you need to look in the mirror, just that tone of voice may trigger something in us, which adds up and connects with all those memories of when my father said to me, you need to look at yourself. Uh, and, and then I react to you from all that past. And it's a lot more in the circumstance than that. But if I say, when you said, you need to look in the mirror, I feel hurt. I have a need for respect. Would you be telling, would you be willing to tell me what you meant by that? Then the person could say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to help you. I, I noticed you had some spaghetti on your face and I wanted you to look in the mirror so you could clean it off. Well, thank you so much. And then I can separate those two incidences together and that helps us to move into forgiveness. Now, if we don't see the whole picture clearly, we're not going to be able to forgive because if I think and I've determined that you actually offended me and you disrespected me and you're mean, how am I going to, I didn't like that. But if I open up my mind and I understand, then maybe I have a conversation with you and I get a little deeper understanding and maybe I have some empathy for myself. I have a need for respect and I didn't get respect when I was a child. And so I have low self-esteem. When anybody gives me feedback or corrects me, I feel uncomfortable because I don't feel very good about myself. You know, so how can I be kind to myself? You know, it, it takes a lot to really understand what's going on inside there. It's a lot of stuff is going on in the subtle level that we are completely unaware of. And we're not getting that information so that we can get a clear picture. So if I understand, well, I have some, you know, self-esteem issues. And when you said that, I felt really hurt. And, um, you know, um, you know, is there another way you could say that? Or what were you trying to say? And, well, I was just trying to say this and I didn't really mean to hurt you. And I'm sorry if I hurt you. And, you know, you could have like a, a, a nice discussion if you got some clarity about it. You know, if you got some clarity about what was going on. Now, forgiving ourselves is really important because if I don't know how to forgive myself, I'm not really going to be able to forgive others. Who is it that's the hardest person for us to forgive? Ourselves. The hardest person to forgive. Yeah, you know why? Because when I see you doing something, oh my God, he's such a hypocrite. Oh my God, that's like, I'd never do that. That's disgusting. You know, but then when I notice that I cheated or I said something or I said a little white lie inside, I feel it. The super soul tells me, hey, you just told him not to do it. You just did that. I feel shame, but it's so embarrassing. <sighs> oh, my God, I can't believe I just did what I hate. I hate when people do that. And I just did that. We got to cover that over because they got it out here at you and I can point it out to you because that doesn't feel so bad. But the reason it bothers me is because I got some of that in here. So it, we can look at ourselves and see what my habit is and what I do and how I'm hypocritical and how I'm out of integrity. And if I can address that and take responsibility for that and forgive myself. I can forgive anybody because it's like somebody's yelling at me. Oh, and I never yelled at anybody in my life. <laughs> I yelled at tons of people. I hurt tons of people's feelings. I was, I would scream. So yeah, I hurt a lot of people when I was not conscious and not. So yeah, I can see how people can do that sometimes. And oh my God, this person's crying. I know how it feels to feel them depressed. I was depressed. And I couldn't get myself out of it. And some people get in those stuck places. And then the best they can do is vent out at somebody else. So, you know, if I can have some understanding of myself that I'm doing the best that I can, everybody is doing the best that they can. It's not that everybody's best is the same, 
but everybody is doing the best that they can with what they've got, with where they are, with what they understand, with what they've integrated. And it's not my job to change them. It's my job to understand me. And when I understand me and forgive me, I can forgive anybody because what everybody has done, I've done it too. I, I've done it. Somewhere in my life, I've done it. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't even recognize it. I wouldn't even be able to see it. I would be naive to it, right? I wouldn't be able to see it. If I can see it, it means I have some experience of it. Beautiful. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. That's a lot to now. You know, you're sharing a lot of wisdom here with us. I feel that uh, many of these concepts could be further unpacked. So, yeah, when you said about uh, say exploring our needs, you you also talked about earlier about a word say something like self absorption or self obsession, mm -hmm. or there is something in you know, a narcissism. Mm -hmm. So, how do we decide mm -hmm. that? When I'm taking care of my needs, is it actually I'm addressing my needs or I'm simply pampering myself? So that can happen yeah. at the phys physical level also. I think that can easily happen at the emotional level where we start, where yeah. self-care yeah. becomes a excuse for self-indulgence. Yes, it could. Anything can be misused. Self-care can be misused. Uh, um, Re, uh, renunciation can be misused, detachment can be misused, attachment can be misused, it can all be misused. Every every single quality can be misused, it can all be misused. Um, so um, it takes something to, you know, get clarity on, um, you know, what's going on inside of us. And it takes um, practice and um, presence. So like the things that we're talking about here, you know, we can talk about them and we can give answers, but then actually applying them as a practice. So if you can, just because I'm answering so many questions and my mind is kind of racing, represence me to your question again so I can direct my thoughts specifically on the on the question that you asked can you ask it in another way are you asking this to me or are you saying that we should ask this yeah, to I'm asking others you, no 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 i'm asking you right now in the in the reality to ask me your question again so i can represence myself okay so uh, how do i know whether mm -hmm. i am going from self care towards self indulgence I am okay. going towards the self-absorption, narcissism. Okay. Okay. So this is the beginning of spiritual life. It's called honesty and integrity. It's called honesty and integrity. So Krishna's in our heart. So so we can judge. We can we can we can assess. Is this helping me to remember Krishna more? Is this helping me to uh be compassionate to others and caring to others? Is this happen, helping me in my service mood? Or am I being um, distracted? We could ask, is this the best I can do right now? Sometimes we might not, we might, there might be times when we're going through some trauma and, and we may need to take more time and care with ourselves. And we may have to be a little more absorbed in ourselves that may be there in the beginning just like a child needs more care when they're younger and as they get older they can start to take care of themselves so we just have to keep asking ourselves and krishna you know what do i need you know what's an appropriate way and a favorable way for me to fulfill this need um we can ask ourselves Am I overindulging? Am I pampering myself? And we can just ask ourselves those questions and we'll get the answers 
if we ask, if we really want to know, we'll get the answer. But if we're attached, I want to eat a chocolate cake every day, and we're attached to eating our chocolate cake every day, we are going to give all the justifications why we have to have it. But if we're not attached, if we're saying, okay, Krishna, I love chocolate cake, and there's a chocolate cake there, so do I really need to eat chocolate cake every day, or is it just self-indulgence? And if I'm really detached and I really want to know what Krishna wants me to know, then he'll say, come on, look at, you know, you're gaining weight, your stomach's hurting, uh, you know, you're, 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 you just got a blood test and you don't have enough protein in your blood. Come on, let's be real here. So if we're attached in any way, our ability to ascertain if we're being self-indulgent or self-aware will be clouded. So integrity and honesty, self-honesty, those are the first steps we stand on to really get our grounding. If we, if we can't be honest with ourselves and we can't be in integrity, you know, then we're not going to have the clarity to be able to ascertain deeper questions about am I pampering or not pampering. Now, sometimes, you know, when we're going through a stressful time in our life, sometimes we need to bury our pain and we do it by eating. It's a coping mechanism. Sometimes if we're in extreme anxiety, somebody just died or we can't process, maybe we stop eating. Maybe we sleep for three days because we can't process it. You know, so it can be different every day. What might seem like is self-indulgence at a certain period of time, it could just be a way of dealing with grieving. It could just be dealing with the way of like, you know, depression or stress. So it's not a once over answer that I am, I am this, I am self-absorbed. Are my habits and my practicing practices kind of pulling me towards self-absorption or are they helping me with my self-development and self-realization and, and connection with Krishna? If we really want to know and we really want to connect and we're really asking those questions, we'll be able to get the clear answer. It really depends on, on our consciousness. And if we're not ready to hear those answers, we won't get those answers because we're not ready to hear them and we're not ready to take them on. Does that make sense? Hmm. So sometimes maybe we will where, be... When you say that I'm not ready to take it on, what does that mean practically? Then what should I do in that situation? You just do the best you can. <laughs> and maybe the best you can at that point in time is eat a whole chocolate cake because I am so frustrated and so angry. I, you know, I want to kill myself or I'm going to eat this chocolate cake. Well, I'm going to eat the chocolate cake because it's better than killing myself. So that in that day, that <laughs> oh, might God. be the best you can do. <laughs> right, right. It's, you know, it's, it's better to eat the chocolate cake than kill yourself, right? That's a better option. But that doesn't mean that I eat the chocolate cake every day. That means I maybe I need to go see, you know, I mean, maybe need to seek out some some support and some counseling because I'm wanting to eat chocolate cake every day because I want to kill myself every day. Maybe I need to get a, a bigger support system. We take things as information, not as a judgment that I'm self-absorbed. My coping mechanism of eating chocolate cake one day, two days, three days, okay, that might be okay. But if I'm doing it habitually and it's becoming an addiction, I need to look at other support systems that, because that's, that's just a coping mechanism. That is not fully helping me. And if I really want holistic health, spiritual care, I'm going to need to look at a, a bigger perspective. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's I'm not one answer. So, so if you're saying that, no, I'm just trying to uh, trying to see how it would apply practically. So even okay. if I'm going towards self-obsession, uh -huh. I shouldn't uh, 
make that as a reason for condemning myself so no. instead of that okay what is it what need is not being fulfilled because of which i am going toward that becoming self obsessed right and and honesty is there it seems like i'm getting a little obsessed that okay. honesty right there can give you a protection it seems like i'm getting a little obsessed with eating chocolate cake every day that doesn't you know really no, wait a minute just, see Go i was ahead. talking about obsession in a different sense or maybe you are giving an example which i am not connecting see there is one okay. thing is obsession with physical things like say okay. chocolate cake or many things uh-huh. like that uh-huh. but i am talking with about obsession with self care that means right. i start becoming obsessed with you know what am i feeling right now why am i feeling this and what is going on over here so how much well, can that become an obsession and how so you are saying you are using chocolate cake as an example for obsession with self care also is that right yeah well any anything can be an obsession anything austerity can be an obsession i can be obsessed with with um fasting i can be obsessed with you know i can be obsessed with anything i can be obsessed with looking like a great devotee you know there are so many different types of obsessions and some of the more good looking obsessions are harder to distinguish than the you know i can be obsessed with profit adoration and distinction but you know i'm doing a lot of service and i look really good here but you know so you know people don't necessarily see that i'm obsessed with profit adoration and distinction and i might be so we got to be able to be honest as much as we can be honest with ourselves to that degree we can can clear things away if, when i can't be honest if i'm in denial Hmm. There's not too much I'm not going to go too far. I'm not going to go too far. If you're even able to ask the question am I getting obsessed with myself? If you're even able to ask that question, that's a certain level of consciousness and 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 um self-awareness. A lot of times we're not even that self-aware to ask am I being self-obsessed? beautiful i don't even see it yeah so you know honesty is a ground level thing if i can be honest and get out of my denial of what i'm doing that gives us a lot of space to you know move forward if i can be honest that's like that's like the ground that we can stand on but it's it's sometimes hard to be that honest we're used to hiding because we feel shameful i talk about this in my book a lot so so there could be we hiding and there could be neglecting and be, yes mm-hmm. and quite mm-hmm. often neglecting can be we can do it in various ways so i could say that i can become obsessed with my externals so that i i can i can dodge dealing with my internals yeah and similarly the opposite can also happen i can obsess with my internals so that i can dodge dealing with my externals so Could after be, i do absolutely. my internal homework i may also have to do some outer work so yeah and sense, i can be neglecting you... that right exactly anything is possible all those scenarios are all possible that's why we have to be self aware we have to be self honest because it's not the same for anybody it's not the same we deal in different ways we have different levels of coping we have different strengths we have different weaknesses we have different propensities it takes self honesty that's like ground level we haven't really gotten anywhere but we you know just being on the ground is a great place to start beautiful so it's different there's no one size fits all answer mm maya is so integrally diverse she knows how to get each one of us in different ways and she may get us in opposite ways but it's her same energy just like energy can be heating or cooling right she knows exactly how to trick us but if we're honest then we can deal with it and if we're not we're not we're not we're not going very far we're kind of stuck 
Does that make sense? So by honesty, yes, it definitely makes sense. So by now you have mentioned honesty a little bit. Uh, I mean, several times you have mentioned it. So I would maybe I would like to articulate what I understand by honesty, and then you can elaborate. So honesty would basically mean that we acknowledge whatever. we are feeling or whatever is going on without putting any label on it so for That's example say if i if i wake up in the morning and i don't feel fresh the alarm has gone up i meant to wake up i i feel very tired so honesty would mean at one level it you know this this i am feeling tired but this tiredness could just be the because of the laziness that is there initially when we wake up this tiredness could be because i slept very late yesterday and i need more rest this tiredness could be because i had a bad night i had bad dreams and that's why I, although i slept adequate time i didn't get rest that tired that that tiredness could be because maybe i have fallen sick and that's mm -hmm. why i'm feeling like that yeah 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 so honesty would mean that first like say i non judgmentally acknowledge whatever i'm feeling and mm -hmm. then after that i try to analyze it what okay i am feeling like this why am i feeling like this uh huh mm -hmm. but if i just yeah. say oh i am such a lazy person i don't i, I don't wake up whenever i, I said i alarm right. i don't wake up right. i am such a lazy right. person right 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 and that is actually i may think that i am being uh, strict with myself but i am actually uh -huh. dishonest with myself uh huh yeah that's a deep level of honesty actually We don't usually get to that deep of a level of honesty until we start with integrity. Actually, integrity is uh, kind of first before we get to that deep of a level of self-honesty. But yes, that level of self-honesty is is so important because it's like, wow, why am I feeling tired? I got eight hours sleep last night. I should feel fresh. You know, is this a bodily pain? Am I getting sick? Oh, my throat hurts a little bit. Maybe I'm getting sick. That's being really. you know understanding what's going on or oh no i didn't get enough sleep last night no wonder i'm feeling tired do i want to get up yes because i have a lot that i want to do and if i need to take a nap then maybe i'll take one a little later so it's just being really honest but integrity kind of helps us integrity is what what helps me to kind of keep a balance so in spiritual life we want to keep balance right and it's so hard to balance everything so what helps me to keep balance is integrity So integrity is when I honor my word. So if I can keep my word to people and keep my integrity, then I can keep my balance. But if I tell you I'm going to be on this podcast and then I forget about it or I schedule something else or, you know, or I'm not present, you know, or I don't communicate with you, you know, that's out of integrity. So just keeping the bare level integrity, keeping our schedules, keeping our promises, even keeping our promises to ourselves. I promised myself that I would, you know, do my exercise for 15 minutes every day. If I don't keep my word to myself, how am I going to keep my vows to Krishna? You know, it it's all connected. So integrity helps us to keep a balance and it helps us to let us know when Oh maybe I'm taking on too much. I'm breaking my word right and left. I'm like I'm feeling overwhelmed. I can't think straight. I'm starting to yell at people. You know, this is what I usually do. I'm feeling stressed. You know, it's like I'm out of balance. I need to get myself in balance and give myself a little self-care so I can function more efficiently because it's not efficient for me to run around like this and be treating devotees like this. I need to like take on less. so i can do it more qualitatively so that's integrity and that helps us to keep balance and it helps helps to take us to deeper level honesty and it's it's kind of a little simpler cuz sometimes that level of honesty that you were talking about that takes a lot more self reflection like internal self reflection where is integrity is i said i was going to do this and i didn't do this so it's a, like a little bit more easier to see when i'm keeping my integrity and when i'm breaking it does that make sense beautiful so i never thought of integrity in, in this clear terms 
there's more there's more to it too <laughs> so if no, of course of course so just uh, okay while i gather my thoughts gaur kumar prabhu do you have anything yeah. to add ahead, or go ask ahead. yeah so i mean i really appreciate how you um, put humility as, at such a high bar and you said focus on honesty and integrity i really like that and i also liked how you brought forgiveness to being empathetic and i really appreciated that as well so uh, in one sense i'm understanding that we should take it step by step at our level and not jump into these big things that we cannot even reach exactly so, that's what absolutely. i'm doing. that's what i'm getting yes uh, absolutely yeah and and we got to take it at our pace i keep writing in my book you know we're on a we're on a long distance marathon this is not a sprint this is not a race i got to get there first <laughs> this is a marathon i got to pace myself or i'm not even going to make it to the finish line you know mm -hmm. so we got to pace ourselves it's got to be sustainable we got to make sure we got enough water you know we got to train ourselves to you know work ourselves up to the marathon you know some days we train some days we you know take a break so uh it's important to um take step by step and we can appreciate step by step we can appreciate each step we're not in a race we can appreciate wow this is what krishna gave me today how can i serve krishna today and this is the service krishna gave me today and that's what i did and i did my best and today is complete and it was a beautiful day and here's my offering thank you krishna and i can feel complete in that day it's not like i'm not going to feel complete until i get back to godhead well i might be pretty frustrated and agitated between the time of now and when i go back to godhead and if i'm frustrated and agitated and patient i may not get there or it's going to take me a lot longer to get there so step by step with self honesty uh -huh. self integrity will eventually take us where we want to be one step at a time yeah Thank you. then there's more <laughs> but it starts and integrity is kind of easy because it's like i give my word and i keep my word it's something specific and it's doable and it's measurable so it makes it a little easier for us to actually see if we kept our word self honesty can be a little well i'm being honest i'm telling you you're a jerk you know i'm being really straightforward with you here you're a jerk <laughs> it's like well, i think i'm being honest but maybe that's not the fact the fact is you know i'm upset with you because of something you said to me and that's more the truth so integrity really is a little bit more manageable and uh measurable so that's why it's a little easier and that's why we start with that if we can't do that we're not going to be able to do the deeper levels of self honesty now we really uh, maybe we can have another podcast where we go deeper into these subjects <laughs> Oh There's a lot gosh. to discuss. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh! I I would like to ask one last question, and then Gaur Kumar will try to ask anything more. Can do that, and then I'll try to summarize, and you can give some concluding words. So you now I'm trying to like make a mental picture of these three things: humility, honesty, and integrity. So, and you said that now I understood clearly uh -huh. about honesty and integrity. How integrity, because it is it is more connected with our external commitments. it is relatively easier uh -huh. to uh, to gauge whether we are uh -huh. having integrity or not uh, and uh -huh. how uh -huh. the, by that once we start at least becoming observant to that level eventually we can also be honest with ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now i also understand say how honesty and humility are connected in the sense that mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. if uh, now instead of artificially saying that you know i should be humble and i should not feel hurt by this person mm -hmm. whatever they have spoken i honestly mm -hmm. acknowledge mm -hmm. what i am feeling and then try to look at my needs hmm? uh -huh. so now yeah. but how exactly is say humility and integrity related with each other so okay i i don't even really talk about humility like i say humility is such a deep or high or uh advanced quality i just work on being honest if i can be honest 
you know, at deeper levels of honesty, integrity and honesty, that's where I am right now. I can't really talk about humility because it's, it's, it's so vast and deep and um, it's tricky. And there's so many false versions of it. And if I say that I'm humble, I'm probably proud that I'm humble. <laughs> and so then I'm not humble. So humility, I don't even really, I can't talk about that. I, I don't, I can't talk about humility, but I can talk about honesty and integrity. So I can't talk about humility. I'm just sorry. <laughs> it's too deep of a topic. Yeah. Well, I, I, be honest I appreciate you. your humility in not wanting to talk about <laughs> humility. <laughs> it's not humility, it's honesty. It's really honesty. Yeah. I can't really talk about it because it's too deep. But integrity is measurable and honesty is observable. Humility is Krishna's grace. So, you know, I, I can say that much about it. That's true. Integrity is measurable. Uh, honesty is observable. We can observe it inside. And humility is Krishna's grace. How's, how's that? Can you repeat? Integrity is all... Integrity, is, integrity is, 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 is measurable. It's measurable. We can measure it by external standards. Honesty mm. yeah, is observable. Like we can really, you know, we can detect a little deeper when we're being more self-honest. It's observable. And it, and it has different levels of depth to it. Humility comes by Krishna's grace. It, we can't we can't make ourselves humble. Okay, that comes by Krishna's grace. That's why I can't talk about it because I can't do it. It's just only by Krishna's grace. Does that make sense? Mm, true. That's. Gorkumar, you want to ask anything as such? It's... No, Prabhu. I mean, uh, thank you, Mataji, for answering. Wow. Clearly. Wow. It was so fun to be with you. You guys were so. <laughs> interactive and so um, involved and you tolerated my excited conversation. <laughs> oh, it was not just excited, it was illuminating. So usually at the end of the talk, I try to summarize. I'm not sure how much I'll be able to do today because we went over a lot of territory, but let yeah. me try to do something. It's all summarized in my book. All of this and more is inside both of my books. So when is it likely to come out? Um, well, you know, it's, it's, in the it's in the editing stages but i don't know exactly i it'd be nice if it could be published and distributed you know by the end of the year it would be nice if that could happen i just don't know because there's a lot of things that i don't know about but i'm in the final stages of doing my edits you know and then you know i have the charts and i have the pictures i don't have the cover yet i don't have all the you know reference so there's still some work to do so and then you know so uh, let's let's say maybe you know by the end of this year it could be fully out maybe before that maybe by the end of the summer mm. yeah whatever I, krishna wants let's see let's have some blessings from the devotees yeah, I mean, it is you can you can really be blessing them through the books, but also I believe you have a website where if some devotees want to contact you, they can contact you. It's a heart connection. Mm -hmm. So I will, yeah. I'll mention that also in the description. So you are available for devotees to if they want to consult you. Sometimes, if I'm trying to finish the book, then it gets a little overwhelming. Um, I am going to be doing a course on compassionate communication. Um, in like maybe a month or something like that. And it'll be available to weekend course. So maybe I can put that on my website. So if people want to check, they can do that course with me online. So that would be, that would be helping them in another way. That's a group help. And then, um, and I'll be doing some other courses, but you know, they can, people can contact me. I just have to see in integrity what I can actually do. <laughs> If I say I'm going to finish the book, 
then I can't take on too much because that would be out of integrity because then I can't really finish. So I have to balance my integrity. So, but they can, you know, look at my website and, and see, you know, okay. but by the time they look at it and they need it, you know, maybe I'll be more free as soon as I finish these books. I've got one more book on the burner too. Sorry. I didn't tell you about that one. Oh, okay. But anyway. Yeah. So one more. That's a lot of and work. then that's it. Okay. Yes. So, I'm sorry. So can you please summarize? Yeah. So thank you. So we, I'll put the description of the website below and many devotees may okay. want to connect with you. So I think uh, okay. we, we discussed broadly on the theme of uh, the role of self-care in bhakti. Mm -hmm. They could say that the overarching theme. And then you started with your journey where you found that the standard prescriptions were which you followed diligently for more than two decades, almost three decades. They weren't, uh, they weren't working and you were depressed and uh, an intense situation. And that's when you prayed to Krishna for guidance and through say compassionate communication and other resources, you learned them and now you are sharing them with others. And then uh, a major part of the discussion, I think we discussed three main topics subsequently. One was, do devotees mm -hmm. need self-care at all? So... We talked mm -hmm. about isn't our isn't bhakti alone enough? So then there are two three points in that. Mm. Now what does bhakti mean? Now bhakti is it just the devotional activities or bhakti's ambit is broader to include include other activities that help us to practice bhakti? Mm. So mm. then mm. I, I I start I talk show that that Venn diagram of textual, traditional, and applicational spirituality. Yeah, and uh, the idea is that. Just as we use various resources for doing our outer services to Krishna, like if we use a, if a computer, we want to fix it, we go to expert. So then mm. why can't we use mm -hmm. various resources for doing our inner work in Krishna service? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then within that, it is, there's this confusion, say, in the material world, people equate the soul with the mind. Those who are like mm -hmm. spiritually inclined, but we might equate the mind with the soul. Mm -hmm. uh, so we may we may think that the uh, that the spiritual practices will automatically take care of our mental needs or our emotional needs, mm -hmm. but uh, just like the body is a genre in itself, and the body is fractured, we have to go to a doctor. Similarly, our emotions also we need to take care of them, and rather than yeah. seeing that it it we could become obsessed and that can divert us from bhakti, but even while doing core devotional practices, we can get diverted from bhakti. So if we are, if we are earnest, mm -hmm. and like you talk later about if you're honest, then we will avoid getting mm -hmm. obsessed and we will use these mm -hmm. for enhancing our service to Krishna, enhancing our, developing our relationship with Krishna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you said, you talked about how mm -hmm. that, that was one, one theme about why self-care is important. And then in self-care, we discussed about two things. One is judgmental attitude. And then within that also we discussed about humility further, humility, honesty, and integrity. So judgmental attitude, the way we avoid that is by seeing that underlying those judgments, whether it is we passing it on ourselves or others passing it on ourselves, we treat, we treat them with curio curiosity rather than judgmentality. So, you know, you think I am like this. What made you think like that? We ask a question like that. Or even if we do something which is wrong, Rather than beating mm -hmm. ourselves up, you give quite a graphic example. You know, if I have some energy, I use it to beat myself. I can't do anything else with that. So that shift from judgment to curiosity is, is a brilliant, I think, brilliant takeaway from this talk, apart from many others also. But so mm -hmm. curiosity means, okay, why, why, why did I do that? Or why did mm -hmm. I do that? Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. way, we go mm -hmm. below the labels to understand mm -hmm. our needs. Mm -hmm. and those needs mm -hmm. are addressed. So rather than thinking, mm -hmm. if I get angry, I'm simply a short-tempered person or this person is such a arrogant, right. disrespectful person. Right, right. What is my need exactly? When I say respect, yeah. well, respect is like a very broad word. Is mm -hmm. that I want to be acknowledged, I want to be understood, I want to be, what is it actually? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that idea mm -hmm. of emotions as information mm -hmm. can, by that we not only 
we are not suppressing it but we are not even pandering to it we are actually following where they can lead us mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. uh, within that we discussed a lot about this that but uh, the next point was about humility honesty and integrity so you said that humility is a very high virtue we can start with honesty and uh, that means that if i feel if somebody has disrespected me and i feel hurt by that so humility doesn't mean that you know i try to just simply efface myself out of existence and think that i don't matter at all after all it is i who am going to use i am who am going to serve krishna so like if somebody is stepping on my foot then i can't just wish that away so there is outer work and inner work inner work is say if i feel hurt if somebody has insulted me i understand that i am different from my false ego and i situate myself myself as separate from the false ego so then that particular insult will not hurt that much at the same time the mm-hmm. outer work also required it's not that in the name of inner work we just take abuse by others rather right. we also do right. externally so both both are required yes. inner and outer work yes yes that's very good mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then within that so, so it begins with honesty mm-hmm. and uh, honesty also is sometimes difficult so we could say humility is at a high pedestal honesty is a little lower and what is much more accessible for us is integrity integrity mm-hmm. means mm-hmm. if i make some commitments do i keep them whether the commitment mm-hmm. is to others and could be to myself and when i don't yeah. keep them then again rather than beating myself up i uh-huh. evaluate maybe it is because i have taken too many things or because i am not uh-huh. equipped to do these things so uh-huh. we start with integrity then gradually we can move toward mm-hmm. honesty and so you said integrity is measurable mm-hmm. honesty is observable and uh-huh. then humility will be will be something which will come by krishna's grace we could say it is it is receivable or something like that you could try it it's receivable i like that i like yeah. that that's really cool yeah and then we talked about can we get into say obsession about self care you said obsession about everything is possible it could be so rather than putting self care into an entirely different category and being paranoid about it we see mm-hmm. self care like everything else i can get obsessed about eating delicious prasad i can get obsessed about um, about how people are treating me i can get obsessed about even you said there can be like prestigious of obsessions i can get obsessed over austerity and that would give me prestige so obsession is uh, obsession is possible anywhere so we be cautious we are cautious about it and uh, i think uh, you talked about we concluded with talking about how your book is going to come soon and you also have this course where devotees can connect with you so mm-hmm. did i are there any things you would like to add as a concluding message how did you remember all that that's pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> sorry thank you <laughs> so it is wonderful thank you for your time i think your your lively cheerful spirit is it brings this whole podcast to life well i don't know it's really it's really fun to talk about these things because they're um they're really relevant and and we really are alive and real and we and we really we really want to experience that it, it, and so you know these things can help us to to go to those places but you know i i i it's funny because every time i talk i say something new and i give new examples and now i think maybe i should add that to my book <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's a I... every book is like a evolving process yeah i read about author i i read one book on writing and the uh-huh. is that even the award winning books are simply the last drafts of manuscripts that were dragged by the publishers from the authors <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i got to get i got to stop somewhere i'm getting to that stopping point enough is enough but um thank you so much for your time and your excitement about this topic and um if there's anything i can do to serve you please let me know thank you so you much we will be honored to have you again in future sometime and we can go okay. deeper into some of the subjects we have discussed okay it's fun that. and yeah and then um if you can send me the link to the recording that would be good i i could maybe put it on my website huh yes definitely that's another thing done you, after after you put it out yeah yes
Thank you very much for your thank association. Thank you so much. And thank you, Gaur Kumar. Thank you, Shukla Madhavi, very much for sharing your wisdom so generously. And so, generous. it's just you use the word fun. You know, it was like very serious stuff we discussed, but the way you discussed it was very light, very light-heartedly and cheerfully. I think that's also an art, because otherwise it can become very, very dis, very disconcerting. It's yeah. Like, well, you alerted me when I started to become a little disconcerting there. When I started to become a little heavy, you alerted me right there. You said, "Wait a minute, let's get a little heavy." So, <laughs> you, you helped me to lighten up. Mm-hmm. And I would like to thank Gaur Kumar Prabhu also for sparing his time and being with us today. Yeah. And you added a lot yeah. of, I think you you added a lot of good questions as well as you provided us your associations. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank Great you so much. Know. I look forward to meeting again. <laughs>